The Christian in Complete Armor by William Grinnell. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. Chapter 9. Containing three directions more towards the obtaining faith. Thirdly, lift up thy cry aloud in prayer to God for faith. Section 1. Question. But may an unbeliever pray? Some think he ought not. Answer. This is ill news if it were true, even for some who do believe, but dare not say that they are believers. It were enough to scare them from prayer, too. And so it would be, as Satan would have it, that God should have few or none to vouch him in this solemn part of his worship. For they are but the fewest of believers that can walk to the throne of grace in view of their own faith. Prayer is the medium caucus, and also medium graces, a means whereby we give worship to God and also wait to receive grace from God. So that to say a wicked man ought not to pray is to say he ought not to worship God and acknowledge him to be his maker, and also that he ought not to wait on the means whereby he may obtain grace and receive faith. Prayer is the soul's motion Godward, says Baxter. And to say an unbeliever should not pray is to say he should not turn to God, who yet saith to the wicked, Seek the Lord while he may be found, and call upon him while he is near. Desire is the soul of prayer, saith the same learned author. And who dare say to the wicked, Desire not faith, desire not Christ or God? Is his right method for peace of conscience? Page 63. It cannot indeed be denied that an unbeliever sins when he prays, but it is not his praying, it is his sin, but in his praying unbelievingly. And therefore he sins less in praying, than in neglecting to pray. Because when he prays, his sin lies, but in the circumstance and manner. But when he doth not pray, and he stands in a total defiancy to the duty God hath commanded him to perform, and means God hath appointed him to use for obtaining grace, I must therefore, poor soul, bid thee go on for all these bugbears, and neglect not this grand duty which lies upon all the sons and daughters of men. Only go in the sense of thy own vileness, and take heed of carrying purposes of going on in sin with thee to the throne of grace. This were a horrible wickedness indeed. As if a traitor should put on the livery which the prince's servants wear, for no other end but to gain more easy access to his person, that he might stab him, with a dagger he hath under his, this, that cloak. It is not enough to sin, but wouldst thou make God accessory to thy own dishonor also? By this bold enterprise thou dost what lies in thee to do it. Should this be thy temper, which God forbid, if I send thee to pray, it must be with Peter's counsel to Simon Magus. Magus, Acts 8.22 Repent of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. But I suppose thee, to whom now I am directing my advice, to be of a far different complexion, one brought to some sense of thy deplored estate, and so softened by the word that, thy, that thou couldst be content to have Christ upon any terms. Only thou art at a loss in thy own thoughts, how such an important creature, yea, impudent sinner as thou hast been, should ever come to believe on him, so that it is not the love of any present sin in thy heart, but the fear of thy past sins in thy conscience that keeps thee from believing. Now for thee it is that I would gather the best encouragements I can out of the word, and with them shrew thy way with the, to the throne of grace. Go, poor soul, to prayer for faith. I do not fear a childing for sending such customers to God's door. He that sends us to call sinners home unto him cannot be angry to hear thee call upon him. He is not so thronged with such suitors as that 
he can find in his heart to send them away with the denial that come from this request in their mouths. Christ complains that sinners will not come unto him, that they may have life, and he is unwilling they should. Cheer up thy heart, poor creature, and knock boldly. Thou hast a friend in God's own bosom that will procure thy welcome. He that could, without any prayer made to him, give Christ for thee, will not be unwilling, now thou so earnestly prayest, to give faith unto thee. What thou prayest God to give, he commands thee to do. This is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus. 1 John 3.23 So that in praying for faith thou prayest that his will may be done for thee. Yea, that part of his will, which above all he desires should be done, call therefore in emphasis the work of God. John 6.29 This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he has sent. As if Christ had said, If ye do not this, ye do nothing for God. And surely Christ knew his Father's mind best. Oh, how welcome must that prayer be to God that falls in with his chiefest design. Joab found his request in the mouth of a woman of Tekoa to take as he would have it. How could it do otherwise when he asked nothing but what the king liked better than himself did or could? And doth it not please God more, thinkest thou, how strong soever thy desires are for faith are, that a poor humbled sinner should believe than it can do to the creatures himself? Methinks by this time thou shouldest begin to promise thyself, poor soul, a happy return of this thy adventure, which thou hast now sent to heaven. But for thy further encouragement know that this grace which thou so wantest and makest thy moan to God for, it is a principal part of Christ's purchase. That blood which is the price of pardon is the price of faith also, by which poor sinners may come to have the benefit of that pardon, as he hath bought off that wrath which man's sin had justly kindled in God's heart against him. So he hath also that enmity which the heart of the creature is filled with against God, and paid for a new stock of grace, wherewith his bankrupt creature may again set up, so that, poor soul, when thou goest to pray for faith, look up unto Christ as having a bank of grace, lying by him to give out to poor sinners, who see that they have nothing of their own to begin with, and in the sense of this the beggatry, repair to him. Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast received gifts for men. Yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Psalms 68, verse 18. This is beyond all doubt, meant of Christ, and to him apply. Ephesians 4, 8. Now observe first, a bank and treasures of gifts in the hand of Christ. Thou hast. Secondly, who entrust him with them, and that is his Father. Thou hast received gifts, that is, Christ of his Father. Thirdly, when or upon what considerations does the Father deposit this treasure into Christ's hands? Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast received, etc. That is, when Christ had vanquished sin and Satan by his death, and rode in the triumphant chariot of his ascension into the heaven's glorious city, then did Christ receive these gifts as the purchase of his blood, in the payment of an old debt, which God, before the foundation of the world, when the covenant was transacted and struck, promised his son, upon the condition of his discharging sinful man's debt, with the infusion of his own precious blood, unto death. Fourthly, the persons for whose use Christ received these gifts, for men, not angels, for rebellious men, not men without sin, so that poor soul, thy sinful nature and life do not make thee an accepted person, and shut thee out from receiving any of this dole. Lastly, observe the nature of these gifts, in the end they are given Christ for, that God may dwell in them or with them. 
Now nothing but faith can make a soul that hath been rebellious a place meet for the holy God to dwell in. This is the gift indeed. He received all other gifts for, and in a manner. Wherefore the gifts of the Spirit in ministry, apostles, teachers, pastors, etc., but that by these he might work faith in the hearts of poor sinners? Let this give thee boldness, poor soul, humbly to press God for that which Christ hath paid for. Say, Lord, I have been a rebellious wretch, indeed, but did Christ receive nothing for such? I have an unbelieving heart, but I hear there is faith paid for in thy covenant. Christ shed his blood, that thou mightest shed forth thy spirit on poor sinners. Dost thou think that while thou art thus pleading with God, and using Christ's name in prayer to move him, that Christ himself can set without hearing of all this, and not befriend thy motion to his Father? Surely he is willing that what God is indebted to him should be paid, and therefore, when thou beggest faith upon the amount, account of his death, thou shalt find him ready to join issue with thee in the same prayer to his Father. Indeed, he went to heaven on purpose, that poor returning souls might not want a friend at court when they come with their humble petitions thither. Section 2. Fourthly, converse much with the promises, and be frequently pondering them in thy musing thoughts. It is indeed the Spirit's work, and only His, to bottom thy soul upon this promise, and give His word a being by faith in thy heart. This thou canst not do, yet as fire came down from heaven upon Elijah's sacrifice, when he had laid the wood in order, and gone as far as he could, so thou mayest comfortably hope that then the Spirit of God will come with spiritual light and life to quicken the promise upon thy heart. When thou hast been consciously diligent in meditating on the promise, if with withdrawal thou owest God in the thing as he did, who, when he had laid all in order, lifts up his heart to God in prayer, expecting all from him. First Kings chapter 18, verse 36. I know no more speedy way to invite the Spirit of God to our assistance than this. As he tempts the devil to tempt him, that lets his eye glaze or his thoughts glad upon a lustful object, so he bespeaks the Holy Spirit's company and lets out this thought upon holy heavenly objects. We need not doubt, but the Spirit of God is as willing to cherish any good motion as the infernal spirit is to nourish that which is evil. We find the spouse sitting under the shadow of her beloved, as one under an apple tree. Canticles chapter 2 verse 3. And presently she tells us, her fruit is sweet to her taste. What does this, her sitting under his shadow, better signify than a soul sitting under the thoughts of Christ? and the precious promises that grow out of him as branches out of a tree? Do but, O Christian, place thyself here a while. And it were strange if the Spirit should not shake some fruit from one branch or another into thy lap. Thou knowest not, but as Isaac met his bride when he went into the fields to meditate, so thou mayest meet thy beloved while walking by thy meditations in this garden of the promises. Section 3. Lastly, press and urge thy soul home with this strong obligation that lies upon thee, a poor humbled sinner, to believe. Possibly God hath shamed thee in the sight of thy own conscience for other sins, that thou loathest the very thought of them, and durst as well run thy head into the fire, as allow thyself in them. If thou shouldest wrong thy neighbor in his person, name, or estate, it would kindle a fire in thy conscience and make thee afraid to look within doors. Converse, I mean, with thy own thoughts, till thou hast repented of it. And is faith the only indifferent thing, a business left to thy own choice, whether thou wilt be so good to thyself as to believe or no? Truly the tenderness of conscience with many which many humbled sinners express, 
in trembling at or smiting them for other sins, compared with the little sense they express for this of unbelief, speaks as if they thought they offended God in them and only wronged themselves by this their unbelief. Oh, how greatly art thou deceived and abused in thy own thoughts, if these be thy apprehensions. Yea, if thou dost not think thou dishonoreth God, and offended him in a more transcendent manner by thy unbelief, than by all thy other sins. What Bernard saith of a hard heart, I may see, of an unbelieving heart. That is a hard heart indeed, saith he, that trembles not at the name of a hard heart. And that an unbelieving heart indeed, that trembles not at the name of an unbelieving heart. Call a softful man to the bar, and hear what thy soul hath to say, for it's not closing with Christ, and thou shalt then see what an unreasonable re reason it will give. It must be either because he liketh not the terms, or else because thou fearest they are too good ever to be performed. Is the first of these thy reason, because thou liketh not the terms on which Christ is offered? Possibly, mightiest, thou but have Christ, and thy lust with him, thou wouldest have been better pleased, but to part with thy lust to gain a Christ, this thou thinkest is a hard saying. It is strange this should offend thee, which God could not have left out, and truly have loved us. Thou art a sought a devil, if thou dost not think thy sins the worst peace of thy misery. O oh, what is Christ worth in thy thoughts, if thou darest not trust him to recompense the loss of a base loss? That man values gold little, who thinks he should pay too dear for it by throwing the dirt or dung out of his hands, with which they are full to receive it. Well, sinner, the terms for having Christ, it seems, content thee not. Ask then thy soul how the terms on which thou holdest thy lust like thee, canst thou, thinkest thou, better spare the blissful presence of God in Christ in hell, where thy lust, if thou holdest of thy mind, are sure enough to leave thee at last, than the company of thy lust in heaven, whether faith in Christ would as certainly bring thee, then take thy choice and leave it for thy work in hell, to repent of thy folly, but I should think, if thou wouldest be so faithful to thyself as to state the case right, and then seriously acquaint the soul with it, giving it time and leisure to dwell upon it daily, that thou wouldest soon come to have better thoughts of Christ and worse of thy sins. But maybe this is not the reason that keeps thee from believing the terms thou likest highly, but it cannot enter into thy heart to think that ever such great things as are promised should be performed to such a one as thou art. Well, of the two, it is better that the rub in thy way to Christ should lie in the difficulty that thy understanding finds to offer. But this must be removed also. And therefore, fall to work with thy soul and labor to bring it to reason in this particular. For indeed, nothing can be more irrational than to object against the reality and certainty of God's promises. Two things worth wrought on the, thy soul would satisfy thy doubts and scatter thy fears as to this. First, labor to get a right notion of God in thy understanding, and it will not appear strange at all that a great God should do so great things for poor sinners. If a beggar should promise you a thousand pounds a year, you might indeed slight it, and ask where he should have it. But if a prince should promise more, you would listen after it, because he hath an estate that bears proportion to his promise. God is not engaged for more by promise than infinite mercy, power, and faithfulness can see discharge. Be still and know that I am God. Psalms 46, verse 10. Of this psalm, Luther would say, in times of great confusion in the church, Let us sing the 46th psalm 
in spite of the devil and all his instruments. And this clause of it, poor humble soul, that thou mayest sing with comfort in spite of Satan and sin also. Be still, O my soul, and know that he who offers thee mercy, he is God. They that know his name will trust in him. Secondly, pursue well the securities which this great God gives for the performance of his promise to the believer. And thou shalt find them so many and great, though his bare word deserves to be taken for more than our souls are worth, that if we had the most slippery, cheating companion in the world under such bonds for the payment of a sum of money, we should think it were sure enough, and wilt thou not rest satisfied when the true and faithful God puts himself under these, these for thy security, whose truth is so immutable that it is more possible for light to send forth darkness than it is that a lie should come out of his blessed lips. End of chapter 9 Have been read by Peter John Parises The Christian in Complete Armor by William Grinnell Ephesians chapter 6 Verse 16 Chapter 10 An Exhortation to Believers Above all, to look to their faith with some directions for the preserving it. I now turn myself to you that are believers in a double exhortation. First, seeing faith is such a choice grace, be stirred up to a more than ordinary care to preserve faith. Keep that, and it will keep thee and all thy other graces. Thou standest by faith. If that falls, thou fallest. Where shall we find thee, then, but under the enemy's feet? Be sensible of any danger thy faith is in, like the Grecian captain who, being knocked down in fight, asked as soon as he came to himself where his shield was. This he was solicitous for above anything else. Oh, be asking in this temptation and that duty, where is thy faith and how it fares? This is the graces, grace which God would have us chiefly judge and value ourselves by, because there is the least danger of priding in thy self-emptying grace of any other. Romans 12.3 I say, through the grace of God given unto me, and to every man that is among you, not to think more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. There are many gifts which the Romans received from God, but he would have them think of themselves rather by their faith. And the reason is that they may think soberly. Indeed, all of the graces are to be tried by our faith. If they be not fruits of faith, they are of no true worth. This is the difference between a Christian and an honest heathen. He values himself on his patience, temperancy, liberality, and other moral virtues, which he hath to show above others. This, these he expects will command him, commend him to God, and procure him a happiness of, uh, after death. And in these he glories and makes his boast while he lives. But the Christian is kept sober in the sight of these, though they commence graces in him that were but virtues in the heathen, because he hath a discovery of Christ, whose righteousness and holiness by faith becomes his. And he values himself by these, more than what is inherited in him. I cannot better illustrate this than by two men, the one a courtier, the other a countryman and a stranger to court, both having fair estates, but the courtier greatest by far. Ask the country gentleman that hath no relation to court or place in a prince's favor what he is worth, and he will tell you as much as his lands and money amounts to. These he values himself by. But ask the courtier what he is worth, and he, though he has more land and money by far than the other, would tell you he, he values himself by the favor of his prince more than by all his other estate. I can speak a big word, saith he, 
but my prince hath is mine, except his crown and royalty, his purse mine to maintain, his love to embrace me, his power to defend me. The poor heathens, being strangers to God and his favor in Christ, they bless themselves in the improvement of the natural stock and that treasure of moral virtues which they had gathered together with their industry and the restraint that was laid upon their corruption by a secret hand they were not aware of. But the believer, having access by faith into this grace, wherein he stands so high in court, favor with God by Jesus Christ, he doth and ought to value himself chiefly by his faith, rather than any other grace. Though none can show these graces in their true heavenly beauty besides himself, yet it is not in these, but in Christ, who is his by faith, that he blesses himself. The believer, who can say, through mercies, that he hath a heart beautified with those heavenly graces, to which the heathens mock virtues, and the proud self judicially mock graces also, are no more to be compared than the image in the glass is to the face, or the shadow to the man himself. He can say he hath the holiness and truth, which they have but in show and semblance. And this grace of God in him he values infinitely above all the world treasure or pleasure. He hath rather be the ragged saint than the robed sinner. Yea, above his natural life, which he can be willing to lose, and count himself no loser, may he thereby but secure this his spiritual life. But this is not the biggest word that a believer can say. He is not only partaker of the divine nature, but that principle of holiness infused in him. But he is heir to all the holiness, yea, all the glorious perfections that are in Christ himself. All that God is, hath, or does, he hath leave to call his own. God is pleased to be called his people's God, the God of Israel. Second Samuel 23, 3. As a man's house and land bears the owner's name upon it, so God is graciously pleased to carry his people's name on him, that all the world may know who are they he belongs to. Naboth's field is called the portion of Naboth, Second Kings 9.21. So God is called the portion of Jacob, Jeremiah 10.16. Nothing hath God kept from his people, saving his crown and glory. That indeed he will not give to another. Isaiah 42 8. If the Christian wants strength, God would have him make use of his, and that he may do it boldly and confidently. The Lord calls himself his people's strength. 1 Samuel 15 29. The strength of Israel will not lie. Is it righteousness and holiness he is scant in? Behold, where it is is brought unto his hand. Christ is made unto us righteousness. 1 Corinthians 1.13 Called therefore the Lord our righteousness. Jeremiah 33.16 Is it love and mercy they would have? All the mercy in God is at their service. Psalms 31.19 Oh how great is thy goodness which thou hast laid out for them that fear thee. Mark the phrase, laid out for them. His mercy and goodness, it is intended for them as a father that lays by such a sum of money and writes on the bag, this is a portion for such a child. But how comes the Christian to have this right to God and all that vast and untold treasure of happiness which is in him? This indeed is greatly to be heeded. It is faith that gives him a good title unto all this. That which maketh him a child makes him an heir. Now faith makes him a child of God. John 1.12 To as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on him. As therefore, if you would not call your birthright into question and bring your interest in Christ and those glorious privileges that come along with him under a sad dispute in your soul, look to your faith. Question 
But what counsel, may the Christian say, can you give for the preserving of my faith? Answer. To this I answer in these particulars. First, that which was instrumental to beget thy faith will be helpful to preserve thy faith. I mean the word of God. As it was seed for the former purpose in thy conversion, so now it is milk for the present substantiation of thy faith. Lie sucking at thy, this breath, breast, and that often. Children cannot suck long nor digest much at a time, and therefore need the more frequent returns of their meals. Such children are all believers in this world. Precept must be upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. The breast often drawn out for the nourishing of them up to their spiritual life, or else they cannot subsist. It was not ordinary that Moses should look so well as he did after he had fastened, fasted so long. Exodus 34. And truly it is a miraculous faith that must have who will undertake to keep their faith alive without taking any spiritual repast from the word. I have heard of some children that have been taken from their mother's breast as soon almost as born and brought up by hand who yet have done well for their natural life. But I shall not believe that a creature can thrive in his spiritual life who casts off ordinances and weans himself from the word, till I hear of some way, other way of provision that God hath made for the ordinary maintenance of it besides this. And I despair of living so long as to see this proved. I know some that we may hope well of have been for a time persuaded to turn their backs on the word and ordinances, but they have returned well hunger-bitten to their old fare again, yea, with Naamah's uh, bitter complaint in her mouth. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Ro Ruth 1.21 And happy for them that they are come to their stomachs in this life before this food be taken off the t table, never more to be set on. He that taught Christians to pray for their daily bread did suppose they had need of it, and surely he did not mean only or chiefly corporal bread, who in the same chapter bids them seek first the kingdom of God, Matthew six thirty three. Well, Christian, prize thou the word, feed on the word, whether in and be dished up in a sermon at, at the public, or in a conference with some Christian friend in private, or in a more secret duty of reading and meditation by thy solitary self. Let none of these be disused or carnally used by thee, and with God's blessing they shall reap the benefit of it in thy faith. When thy stomach fails to the word, thy faith may needs begin to fail on the word. O oh, that Christians who are so much in complaints of their weak faith, would but turn their complaints into inquiries why it is so weak and declining. Is it not because faith hath missed its wanton meals from the word? Thou haply hast formerly broke through many straits to keep thy acquaintance with God in his word, and wert well paid for that time which thou didst borrow of thy other occasions for this end. But that sweet temper, then, thou fondest thy heart in to trust God and rely upon him in all conditions. But now, since thou hast discontinued thy acquaintance with God in those his ordinances, thou perceivest a sad change. Where thou couldst have trusted God, now thou art suspicious of him. Those promises that were able in thy mutiny in Hubbard of thy unruly passions to have hushed and quieted all in thy soul at their appearing in thy thoughts have now, alas, but little authority over thy murmuring, unbelieving heart to keep it in any other tolerable order. If it be thus with thee, poor soul, thy case is sad, and I cannot give thee better counsel for thy soul than that which physicians give men in a consumption for their bodies. They ask them where they were born and bred up, and to that, their native air, they send them as the best means to recover them. Thus, soul, let me ask thee, if thou ever hadst faith, where was it born and bred up? Was it not in the sweet air of ordinances, hearing, meditating, conferring of the word, 
and praying over the word. Go, poor creature, and get thee as fast as thou canst into thy native air, where thou didst draw thy first Christian breath, and where thy faith did so thrive and grow for a time. No means more hopeful to set thy feeble faith on its legs again than this. Secondly, wouldst thou preserve thy faith, look to thy conscience. A good conscience is the bottom faith sails in. If the conscience be wrecked, how can it be thought that the faith should be safe? If faith be the jewel, a good conscience is the cabinet in which it is kept, and if the cabinet be broken, the jewel must needs be in danger of losing. Now you know what sins waste the conscience, sins either deliberately committed or impenitently commit, continued in. O oh, take heed of deliberate sin, like a stone thrown into a clear stream. It will so disturb thy soul and muddy it, that thou who even now couldest see thy interest in the promise wilt now be at a loss and not know what to think of thyself. They are like a fire on the top of a house. It will be no easy matter to quench it. But if thou hast been so unhappy as to fall into such a sloth, take heed of lying in it by impenitency. The sheep may fall into a ditch, but it is the swine that swallows in it. And therefore how hard wilt thou find it, thinkest thou, to act thy faith on the promise when thou art by thy filthy garments and besmeared countenance, so unlike one of God's holy ones. It is dangerous to drink poison, but far more to lie, let it lie in the body long. Thou canst not act thy faith, though a believer, on the promise, so as to apply the pardon it presents to thy soul, till thou hast renewed thy repentancy. Thirdly, exercise thy faith, if thou meanest to preserve thy faith. We live by faith, and faith lives by exercise. And we say of some stirring men, they are never well, but at work. Confine them to their bed or chair, and you kill them. So here, hinder faith from working, and you are enemies to the very life and being of it. Why do we act faith so little in prayer? But because we are no more frequent in it. Let the child seldom see his father or mother, and when he comes in their presence he will not make much after them. Why are we no more able to live on a promise when at a plunge? Surely, because we live no more with the promise. The more we converse with the promise, the more confident we shall put in it. We do not trust strangers as we do our neighbors in whose company we are almost every day. It were a rare way to secure our faith, yea, to advance it, and all our other graces would we, in our daily course, labor to do all our actions as in obedience to the command, so uh, in faith on the promise. But alas, how many enterprises are undertaken where faith is not called in, nor the promise consulted with from one end of the business to the other? And therefore, when we would make use of faith in some particular strait, wherein we think ourselves to be more than ordinarily at a loss, our faith itself is at a loss, and to seek, like a servant who, because his master very seldom employs him, makes bold to be gaden about, and so when his master doth call him upon some extraordinary occasion, he is out of the way and not to be found. O Christian, take heed of letting your faith be long out of work. If you do not use it when you ought, it may fail you when you desire most to act it. Fourthly, take special notice of that unbelief which yet remains in thee, and as it is putting forth daily its head in thy Christian course, be sure thou loadest thy soul with the sense of it, and deeply humblest thyself before God for it. What thy faith loses by every act of unbelief, it recovers again by renewing the repentancy. David's faith was on the mending hand when he could shame himself hardly for his unbelief. Psalm 73, verse 22. He confesses how foolish and ignorant he was. Yea, saith he, I was a beast before thee. So irrational and brutus his unbelieving thoughts now appeared to him. And by this ingenious humble confession, the malignity of his distemper breathes out that he is presently in his old temper again, and his faith is able to act as high as ever. Thou hast holden me by my right hand, thou hast guided me with thy counsel, and after received me to glory. 
verse 23 and 24. But so long thy unbelief is sure to grow upon thee, as thou art a humbled for it. We have the reason why the people of Landish were so bad. Judges chapter 18, verse 7. There was no magistrate in the land that might put them to shame in anything. Christian, thou hast a magistrate in thy bosom, commissioned by God himself, to check, reprove, and shame thee when thou sinnest. Indeed, all things go to wreck in that soul where that this doth not its office. Hear, therefore, what this hath to charge thee with, that thou mayst be ashamed. There is no sin dishonors God more than unbelief, and this sword cuts his name deepest when in the hand of a saint. O, oh, to be wounded in the house of his friends! This goes near the tender heart of God. And there is reason enough why God should take this sin so unkindly at a saint's hand, if we consider the near relation such a one stands in to God. It would grieve an indulgent father to see his own child come into court and there bear witness against him, and charge him of some untruth in his words, more than if a stranger should do it. Because the testimony of a child, though when it is for the vindication of a parent, may lose some credit in the opinion of those that hear it upon the suspicion of partiality. Yet, when against a parent, it seems to carry some more probability of truth than what another that is a stranger says against him. Because the bond of natural affection with which the child is bound to his parent is so sacred that it will not be easily suspected, he can offer violency to it only upon the more inviolable necessity of bearing witness to the truth. O oh, think of this, Christian, again and again. By thy unbelief thou bearest false witness against God. And if thou, O child of God, speakest no better of thy heavenly Father, and presented him in no fairer character to the world, it would be no wonder if they be confirmed in their hard thoughts of God, even to final impenitency and unbelief, when they shall see how little credit he finds with thee. For all thy great profession of him and near relation to him, when we would sink the reputation of a man the lowest possible, we cannot think of an expression that will do it more effectually than to say, He is such a one as those that are nearest to him. Even his own children dare not trust him, or will not give him a good word. O Christian, ask thyself whether thou couldst be willing to be the happiest instrument to defame God, and take away his good name in the world. Certainly thy heart trembleth at the thought of it, if a saint, and if it doth, then surely thy unbelief, by which thou hast done this so often, would wound thee to the very heart, and bleeding for what thou hast done. Thou wilt beware of taking thy sword in thy hand again, with which thou hast given so many a wound to the name of God and thy own peace. Fifthly, if thou wouldest preserve thy faith, labor to increase thy faith. None in more danger of losing what they have than those poor spirited men who are content with what they have. A spark is sooner smothered than a flame. A drop is easier drunk up and dried than a river. The stronger thy faith is, the stronger thy faith is from the enemy's assaults. The intelligence which an enemy hath of a castle being weakly provided for in a siege is enough to bring him against it, which else would not have been troubled with his company. The devil is a coward. He loves to fight on the greatest advantage, and greater he cannot have than the weakness of the Christian's faith. Dost thou but know, Christian, the many privileges of strong faith above a weak Thou wouldest never rest till thou hast it. Strong faith comes conqueror out of those temptations where weak faith is foiled and taken prisoner. Those Philistines could not stand before Samson in his strength, who durst dance about him scornfully in his weakness. When David's faith was up, how undauntedly did he look death in the face. 1 Samuel 30, verse 6 But when that was out of his heart, oh, how poor-spirited is he! ready to run his head into every hole, though never so dishonorably to save himself. 1 Samuel 21, verse 13. Strong faith, it frees the Christian from those heart-rending thoughts, which weak faith must needs be oppressed with. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Isaiah 26, verse 3. So much faith, so much inward peace and quietness. If little faith, 
than little peace and serenity through the storms that our unbelieving fears will necessarily gather. If strong faith, then strong peace. For so the repetition in the Hebrew, peace, peace, imports. It is confessed, weak faith hath its much peace with God through Christ, as the other hath by his strong faith, but not so much bosom peace. Weak faith will as surely land the Christian in heaven as strong faith, for it is impossible the least dram of true grace should perish, being all incorruptible seed. But the weak doubting Christian is not like to have so pleasant a voyage thither as another with strong faith. Though all in the ship come safe to shore, yet he that is all the way seasick hath not so comfortable a voyage as he that is strong and helpful. There are many delightful prospects of cure in a, a current journey, which he that is sick and weak loses the pleasure of. But the strong man views all with abundancy of delight, and though he wishes with all his heart he was at home, yet the entertainment he hath from these do much shorten and sweeten his way to him. Thus, Christian, there are many previous delights, which saints traveling to heaven meet on their way thither besides what God hath for them at their journey's end. But it is the Christian whose faith is strong and active on the promise that finds that. This is he who sees those spiritual glories in the promise that ravages his soul with unspeakable delights, while the doubting Christian's eye of faith is so gummed up with unbelieving fears that he can see little to affect him in it. This is he that goes singing all the way with the promise in his eye, while the weak Christian kept in continual pain with his own doubts and jealousies, goes sighing and mourning with a heavy heart, because his interest in the promise is yet under a dispute in his own thoughts. As you would not therefore live uncomfortably, and have a dull, melancholy walk of it to heaven, labor to strengthen your faith. Question. But may be, you will ask, how may I know whether my faith be strong or weak? Answer. I answer by these following characters. First, the more entirely a Christian can rely on God, upon his naked word in the promise, the stronger his faith is. He surely puts greater confidence in a man that will take his own word or single bond for a sum of money than he who dares not, except some others be bond for him. When we trust God for his bare promise, we trust him on his own credit, and this is faith indeed. He that walks without staff or crutch is stronger than he that needs these to lean on. The promise is the ground faith goes on. Sense and reason, these are the crutches which weak faith loans on too much in its acting. Now, soul, inquire. First, canst thou bear up thyself on the promise, though the crutch of sense and present feeling be not at hand? Maybe thou hast had some discoveries of God's love, and beaming forth of his favor upon thee. And so long as the sun shined thus in at the window, thy heart was lightsome, and thou thoughtest thou shouldest never distrust God more, nor listen to thy unbelieving thoughts more. But how findest thou thy heart now, since those sensible demonstrations are withdrawn, and maybe some frowning providence sent in the room of them? Dost thou presently dispute the promise in thy thoughts, as not knowing whether thou mayest venture to cast anchor on it or no? Because thou hast lost the sense of his love, does thy eye of faith fail thee also, that thou hast lost the sight of his mercy and truth in the promise? Surely the eye of faith is weak, or else it would read the promise without these spectacles. The little child, indeed, thinks the mother is quite lost if she goes but out of the room where he is. But as it grows older, he will be wiser, and truly, so will the believer also. Christian, bless God for the experiences and sensible tastes thou hast at any time of thy love, but know that we cannot judge of our faith, whether weak or strong by them. Experiences, saith Parisius, P-A-R-I-S-I-E-N-S-I-S, are like crutches, which do indeed help a lame man to go, but they do not make the lame man sound or strong. Food and physics must do that. And therefore, Christian, labor to lean more on the promise and less on sensible expressions of God's love, whether it be in the present feeling 
or past experiences of it. I would not take you off from improving these, but leaning on these and limiting the acting of our faith to these. A strong man, though he doth not lean on his staff all the way he goes, as the lame man doth on his crutches, which bears his whole weight, yet he may make good use of it now, and then to defend himself when set upon by a thief or dog in his way. Thus, the strong Christian may make good use of his experiences in some temptations, though he doth not lay the weight of his faith upon them, but the promise canst thou. Secondly, bear thyself upon the promise. When the other crutch or reason breaks under thee, or does thy faith even fall to the ground with it? That is a strong faith indeed that can trample upon the improbabilities and impossibilities which reason would be objecting against the performances of the promise and gives credit to the truth of it. Thus Noah fell hard to work about the ark upon the credit he gave both to the threatening and promissory part of God's word and never troubled his head to clear the matter to this reason how this, these strange things would come to pass. And it is imputed to the strength of Abraham's faith that he would not suffer his own narrow reason to have the hearing of the business when God promised him a Michaelmas spring, as I may so say, a son in his old age. Romans 4.19 and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body that was now dead. And skillful swimmers are not afraid to go above their depth, whereas young learners feel for the ground and are loath to go far from the bank side. Strong faith fears not when God carries the creature beyond the depth of his reason. We know not what to do, saith good Jehoshaphat, but our eyes are upon thee, Second Chronicles 20. As if he had said, We are in a sea of troubles, beyond our own help, or any thought how we can wind up of these straits. But our eyes are upon thee. We dare not give our case for desperate, so long as there is strength in thy arm, tenderness in thy bowels, and truth in thy promise. Whereas weak faith, that is groping for some footing for reason to stand on, it is taken up how to reconcile the promise and the creature's understanding. Hence, those many questions which drop from its mouth. When Christ said, Give ye them to eat, Mark 6, his disciples asked him, Shall we go and buy two hundred penny worth of bread? As if Christ's bare word could not spare that cost and trouble. Whereby shall I know this, saith Zacharias to the angel, for I am an old man, Luke 1. Alas, his faith was not strong enough to digest, at present, this strange news. Secondly, the more composed and contented the heart is under the charges which providence brings upon the Christian state and condition in the world, the stronger his faith is. Weak bodies cannot bear the change of weather so well as healthful, healthful and strong do. Hot and cold, fair and foul, cause no great alteration in the strong man's temper, but alas, the other is laid up by them, or at best goes complaining of them. Thus, strong faith can live in any climate, travel in all weather, and uh, fadge any condition. I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content, saith Paul, Philippians 4.11. Alas, all Christian scholars are not of Paul's form. Weak faith hath not yet got the mastery of this hard lesson. When God turns thy health into sickness, thy abundance into penury, thy honor into scorn and contempt, in what language dost thou now make thy condition known to God? Is thy spirit embittered into discontent, which thou ventest in murmuring complaints, or art thou well satisfied with God's dealings? so as to acquiesce cheerfully in thy present portion, not with an insensibilityness of the affliction, but approbation of divine appointment? If the latter thy faith is strong, first it shows God hath a thr throne in thy heart, thou reverence his authority and ownest his sovereignty, or else thou wouldest not acquiesce in, in, in his orders. I was dumb because thou didst it. Psalms 39.9 
If the blow had come from any other hand, he could not have taken it so silently. When the servant strikes the child, he runs to his father and makes his complaint. But though the father doth more to him, he complains not of his father, nor seeks redress from any other, because it is his father, whose authority he reveres. Thus thou comportest thyself towards God. And what but a strong faith can enable thee? Be still and know that I am God. Psalms 46, verse 11. We must know God believingly to be what he is, before our hearts will be still. Secondly, this acquisition of spirit under the disposition of providence shows that thou dost not only stand in awe of his sovereignty, but hath amiably, comfortably, thoughts of his mercy and goodness in Christ. Thou believest he can soon and certainly will make thee amends, or else thou couldst not so easily part with these enjoyments. The child grows willingly to bed when others, maybe, are going to supper at a great feast in the family, but the mother promises the child to save something for him against the morning. This the child believes and is content. Surely thou hast something in the eye of thy faith, which will recompense all thy present loss, and this makes thee fast so willingly, when others feast, be sick, when others are well. Paul tells us why he and his brethren in affliction did not faint. Second Corinthians 14.16 They saw heaven coming to them, while earth was going from them, for which cause we faint not. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Thirdly, the more able to wait long for answers to our desires and prayers, the stronger faith is. It shows the tradesman to be poor and needy when he must have ready money for what he sells. They that are forehanded are willing to give time and able to forbear long. Weak faith is all for the present, if it hath not presently its desires answered. Then it grows jealous, lays down sad conclusions against itself. His prayer was not heard, or he is not one God loves, and the like. Much ado to be kept out of a fainting fit. I said in my haste, all men are liars. But strong faith that can trade with God for time, yea, wait God's leisure. He that believes makes not haste. Isaiah 28, verse 16. He knows his money is in a good hand, and he is not over quick to call for it home, knowing well that the longest voyages have the richest returns. As rich ground can do without rain longer than lean or sandy, which must have a shower ever and anon, or the corn on it fades, or as a strong, helpful man can fast longer without faintness than the sickly and weak. So the Christian of strong faith can stay longer for spiritual refreshing from the presence of the Lord and the returns of his mercy and discoveries of his love to him than one of weak faith. Fourthly, the more the Christian can lose or suffer upon the credit of the promise, the stronger his faith is. If you should see a man part with a fair inheritance and leave his kindred and country, where he might pass his days in the embracements of his dear friends, and the del de delicious fare with a plentiful estate which could afford him every day, to follow a friend to the other end of the world, with hunger and hardship, through sea and land and a thousand pearls that meet him on every hand, you would say that this man had a strong confidence in his friend and a dear love to him, would you not? Nay, if he should do all this for a friend whom he never saw, upon the bare credit of a letter which he stands to invite him to come over to him, with the promise of great things that he would do for him now, to throw all his present possessions and enjoyments at his heels, and willingly put himself into the condition of a poor pilgrim and traveler, with the loss of all he hath, that he may come to his dear friend. This adds to the wonder of his confidence. Such... Gaelic spirits, we read of in 1 Peter 1, 6 8, Whom having not seen, ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing ye rejoice, etc. Observe the place, and you shall find them in sorrowful plight, in heaviness through manifold temptations, yet because their way lies through the sloth to the enjoyment of God and Christ, whom they never saw or knew, 
but by the report of the word makes of them they can turn their back on the world's friendships and enjoyments with which it courted them as well as others and go with a merry heart through the deepest of them all here is glorious faith indeed it is not praising of heaven and wishing we were there but a cheerful abandoning the dearest pleasures and embracing the greatest sufferings of the world when called to the same with evidence our faith to be both true and strong fifthly the more easily that the christian can repel motions and resist temptations to sin the stronger is his faith the snare or net which holds the little fish fast the greater and stronger fish easily break through the christian's faith is strong or weak as he finds it easy or hard to break from temptation to sin when an ordinary temptation holds thee by the heel and thou art entangled in it like a fly in a spider's web much ado to get off and persuade thy heart from yielding truly it speaks faith very feeble to have no strength to oppose the assaults of sin and lust speaks the heart void of faith where faith hath not a hand to prostrate an enemy it yet hath a hand to lift up against it and a voice to cry out for help to heaven some way or other faith will show its dislike and enter its pro protest against sin and to have little strength to resist evidences of weak faith peter's faith was weak when the maid's voice dashed him out of countenance but it was well amended when he could withstand and with a noble consistency disdain threats of a whole council acts chapter fourteen verse seventeen christian compare thyself with thyself and give righteous judgment on thyself do thy lust as powerfully avenge thy heart and carried away from god as they did some months or years ago or canst thou in truth say thy heart is got above them since thou hast known more of christ and had a view of his spiritual glories thou canst now pass by their door and not look in yea when they knock at thy door in a temptation thou canst shut upon them and disdain the motion surely thou mayest know thy faith is grown stronger when we see that the clothes which a year or two ago were even fit for the person well now not now come on him they are so little we may easily be persuaded to believe the person is much grown since that time if thy faith were no more grown the, those temptations which fitted thee when they would like be as well now find but the power of sin die and thou mayest know that faith is more lively and vigorous the harder the blow the stronger the arm is that gives it a child cannot strike such a blow as a man weak faith cannot give such a home blow to sin as a strong faith can sixthly the more ingenuity and love is in thy obedient walking the stronger thy faith is faith works by love and therefore its strength or weakness may be discovered by the strength or weakness of that love it puts forth in christians acting the strength of a man's arm that draws a bow is seen by, f by the force the arrow which he shoots flies with. And certainly the strength of our faith may be known by the force that our love mounts to God with. It is impossible that weak faith, which is unable to draw the promise, as a strong faith can, should leave such a forcible impression on the heart to love God as the stronger faith does. If, therefore, thy heart be strongly carried out from love to God, to abandon sin, perform duty, and exert acts of obediency to his command, know thy place and take it with humble thankfulness. Thou art a graduate in the art of believing. The Christian's love advances by equal paces with his faith, as the heat of the day increases with the climbing sun. The higher that mounts towards its uh, median, the hotter the day grows so the higher faith lifts christ up in the christian and the more intense his love to christ grows which now sets him on work after another sort that then he was wont before when he was to mourn for his sins he was acted by a slavish fear and made an ugly face at the work as one doth that drinks some unpleasing portion but now acts of repentance are not distasteful and formidable, since faith hath discovered mercy to sit on justice's brow, and undeceive the creature of those faults and cruel 
thoughts of God, which ignorantly he hath taken up concerning him. He doth not n now hate the word repentancy, as Luther said he once did, before he understood that place, Romans one seventeen, but goes about the work with amiable, sweet apprehensions of a good God, that stands ready with the sponge of his mercy, dipped in Christ's blood, to blot out his sins as fast as he scores them, by his humble, sorrowful confessions of them. And the same might be said concerning all other offices of Christian piety. Strong faith makes the soul ingenuous. It does not pay the performance of any duty, as an oppressed subject doth a heavy tax, with a deep sigh, to think how much he parts with. But as freely as a child would present his father with an apple of that, of that orchard, which he holds by gift from him, Indeed, the child, when young, is very servile and selfish, forbearing what his father forbids for fear of the rod, and doing what he commands for some fine thing or other that his father bribes him with, more than for pure love to the person or obediency to his will and pleasure. But as he grows up and comes to understand himself better in the relation he stands in, with the many obligations of it to final obedience, then his servitude servitility and selfishness wear off, and his natural affection will prevail more with him to please his father than any other argument whatever. And so with it, with the Christian, where faith is of any gr growth and ripeness. Seventhly, to name no more, the more able faith is to sweeten the thoughts of death and make it desirable to the Christian, the stronger his faith Things are very sharp or sour, will take much sugar or make them sweet. Death is one of those things which hath the most ungrateful taste to the creature's palate that can be. Oh, it requires a strong faith to make the serious thoughts of it sweet and desirable. I know some in a pet or passion have professed great desires of dying, but it hath been as a sick man desires to change his place merely out of weariness of and discontent with his present condition, without any due consideration of what they desire. But a soul that knows the consequences of death, and the unchangeableness of that state, whether of bliss or misery, that it certainly marries us to, will never cheerfully call for death in his cordial desires, till he be in some measure resolved from the promise what in entertainment he may expect from God, when he comes into that other world, and that a weak faith will not do, without an abundancy of fears and doubts. I confess that sometimes a Christian of very weak faith may meet death with as little fear upon his spirit, yea, more joy than one of the far stronger faith, when he is helped by up by the chin, by some extraordinary comfort, poured into his soul from God immediately, which, should God withdraw, his fears would return upon him, and he feel again his faintings, as a sick man that hath been strangely cheered with a strong cordial does his feebleness, when the efficiency of it is spent. But we speak of the ordinary way in which Christians come to have their hearts raised above the fear, yea, into a strong desire of death, and that is by obtaining to a strong faith. God can indeed make a feast of a few loaves and multiply the weak Christian's little faith on a sudden, and as he lies on a sick bed, into a spread table of all varieties of consolations. But I fear God will not do this miracle for that man or woman, who upon the examination of this contends himself with the little provision of faith he hath, and labors not to increase his store against that spending time. End of chapter 10, having been read by Peter John Parises.